فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the subject that i want to discuss today is what raised asalahuddin in the past for al- for masjid al aqsa my dear brothers and sisters we are all aware of the situation or the dire situation of the mass murder the killings the genocide that is happening in gaza in palestine for the last 14 to 15 weeks much more than 100 days now we have been talking about it i'm sure we have all been seeing the evidences of it we've all been hearing the imams speak about it what i want to focus today is to discuss the interim period from the history where when we lost al aqsa and the massacres against the people of palestine began until the victory that allah blessed palestine with in the presence of the blessings of salahuddin al ayyubi rahimahullah today when we talk about palestine we see all the devastation and destruction that is happening there looking at that the pain and the suffering of the people we all do feel down we all feel embarrassed we all feel ashamed we all feel disheartened at that but let us remind ourselves from the history that it did happen a very similar scenario in the past as well masjid al aqsa the first time it was conquered it was taken over by umar ibn al khattab radiyallahu an after the demise of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was the second khalifa since that time up until now for almost 1400 years it has remained under the power of the muslims as promised by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as promised by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in between there has been some durations where it has been snatched away from the believers the first time it was snatched away it was in 1099 christian era which is almost 900 years before us and then it was reclaimed by the blessed victorious salahuddin al ayyubi in 1187 christian era which is almost 800 years from our time today so it's almost after 700 years that al aqsa has been snatched away from us again and we have lived for almost 75 years with somebody else not just ruling al aqsa but somebody killing murdering continuously humiliating abusing and committing genocide after genocide massacre after massacre against the people of palestine what i want to spend time today to discuss is what actually happened between 1099 and 1187 that gave rise to the blessed salahuddin we are all craving today as well we are all making dua today as well we are all praying wishing and hoping that there will be a salahuddin once again to bring victory to the people of palestine and to bring victory to liberate to free al aqsa as well and inshallah that is going to happen it is one of the promises of allah and his messenger that whenever there is oppression when there are, whenever there is massacres whenever somebody goes against the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah will replace them and bring a change but the question is where did salahuddin come from the question is what was the circumstances that created that gave rise to a salahuddin and that is what i want to discuss today inshallah so we have a very little time obviously but let's quickly try go briefly between 1099 to 1187 i span of almost 87 88 years which gave the victory of al aqsa over palestine in the last time in 1099 the crusaders of the time they came they attacked palestine they attacked al aqsa they attacked its inhabitants and they massacred them it is said that in 10 days in 10 days the armies of the crusaders when they came and took over al aqsa and started to kill the people of palestine in within 10 days almost 150000 people were massacred in jerusalem and the neighboring cities now from amongst the muslims who were there they started to move around move away from there some of them reached damascus damascus as we say in modern day syria when they reached there it was a scenario like this a masjid where people were sitting and the and the speaker the, the imam the khatib was speaking 
And this Imam, his name is Zainul Islam Al Harawi. And this Imam, when he saw this image of some of the brothers and sisters from Palestine who came with their plight, with blood stained on their clothes, with dust around their hairs, and they were tired and they were horrified, and they displayed the the genocide that was taking place, the massacre that was taking place in Palestine, in Jerusalem at the time. On seeing this, on hearing this, this Imam Zainul Islam Al Harawi, he did not sit idle, rather he enacted, he did something, he struggled, he strived to do something with whatever was within his capacity. And this is the discussion that we need to understand. When we hear of the troubles that we see in Palestine today, when we see the evidences of that, do we sit idle doing nothing or do we have a role to play here? And this Imam Zainul Islam Al Harawi, while he had his own sessions going on, his classes happening, his books open, there were people listening to him, but he decided that he got to do something. So he made a small group of people, he got them ready, he prepared, and he went to Baghdad. We're talking about within one week of the of losing Al Aqsa, within one week of that. And this Imam with a group of people, he reaches Baghdad to talk to the Khalifa of the time. That was the time of the Abbasid Khalifa. And he reached Baghdad and he wanted to meet the Khalifa. Now as usual, interestingly, the Muslim rulers, for example, we see them in our times as well. None of them have acted in the last hundred days to assist, to support, or to move an army to defend the people of Gaza. And we're seeing that more than 25,000, they're saying now almost 30,000 people have been bombed to death. And only Allah knows how many more are dying on a daily, day, on a daily basis because of the siege, because of no food and water and no medical supplies. How many more people are going to continue to die? Very similar in those days, the Muslim rulers were also of a very similar format. So the Abbasid Khalifa, the men around him, he did not allow the Sheikh Zainul Islam to come and meet him. So he reaches to the biggest mosque in Baghdad. And it was Jum'ah and it was Ramadan. He enters the masjid. He goes in between the people, the khutbah is going on, the people are sitting. And in between he tries to create a scene so that people could listen to the plight of the Palestinian issue. Now he stands in the middle and he takes out a date in Ramadan on Jum'ah during the khutbah and he starts to eat the date. Now just imagine, what would be the response to that? Obviously from an Islamic perspective, it is haram, while the khutbah is going on, it is haram to do anything else other than listening to the khutbah. On the other hand, it is Ramadan, so you cannot, in Ramadan, while fasting, you cannot eat. Even if you are not fasting for whatever reason, you're not allowed to eat in public. Now this sheikh, he stands in the middle of the masjid, while the masjid is full, the biggest mosque in Baghdad, and he starts to eat the date. Now the people are furious, they get upset, they get angry and they try to reach out to him and say, how could you do this? And interestingly in that masjid they had a specific channel where the Khalifa would come and also attend the Jummah. So the Imam chose this opportunity to come to the masjid because he was not allowed to talk to the Khalifa. He comes to the masjid and he does this act and when he does, people all get furious against him and he reminds them. And now he got his opportunity and he says to them, you are angry because I'm eating a small date. Yes, in Ramadan, yes, while fasting, which is wrong. And you are rightly angry there. But where is your anger? And where are your emotions? When 150,000 Muslims have been massacred in the last two weeks and Al-Aqsa, one of the third holiest mosques has been snatched away from us. Where is your response to that? And the people did, understood the message that he was trying to convey to them. This gave him an opportunity to now speak to the Khalifa as well. So the Khalifa's men now allowed him to come and talk to the Khalifa. The Khalifa listened to his concern, listened to his speech, and you know, verbally he gave him assurance that, you know, inshallah we'll try to do something. But the Khalifa was weak at the time, he was not in, in absolute power. There were no armies under his command. So he would not act much. But the point I'm trying to raise here, my dear brothers and sisters, this Imam Zainul Islam Al Harawi, he could have decided to sit idle and do nothing as many of us would do even in our time. 
but he decided that he's got a role to play. He decided that he needs to speak up. He decided that he needs to create awareness. He decided that he needs to go and talk to those who have some power to do something to protect Al-Aqsa, to protect the rights and to protect the lives of the Muslims of Palestine. A few decades later, another sheikh in the city of Aleppo in Syria, and remember, you know, the rulers in those days as well, there were different rulers in different places. And there was a ruler in Aleppo at the time by the name Ridwan. And he actually had made a treaty with the Crusaders so that he is not attacked. And he was having infight with his own brother, with his own family members for the position of power. Now imagine this, the Muslim rulers of the time, unfortunately we see very similar even in our time. Now anyway, in this situ situation, one of the uh, imams of the time of the city of Aleppo, Abu al-Fadl ibn al-Khashab, he decided to speak up. He said, this is not acceptable for the ruler to make deeds. And you know, even today, subhanAllah, without taking any names, we also hear in our time, so-called normalization deals between those who have captured Al-Aqsa, between those who are committing genocide in, 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 in Palestine, and between some of the Muslim rulers of our time. The hypocrisy was there in the past. The similar hypocrisy, you can see it in our time as well. But some of the scholars, some of the leaders, some of the Muslims of that time, they did not agree to sit idle and do nothing. Now this Imam by the name Al-Khashab, he decides to raise his voice against such normalization against such treaties. And he gets a group of people, he gathers them, he raises the voice in his city Aleppo, and he once again reaches to Baghdad in order to raise the question to the, to the Khalifa, the Basit Khalifa, and urge him to take action at least now. Though this is talking about, say, another five to 10 years in between. So this is early 11th century. Now he reaches Baghdad and he starts and reaches out to the, to the Khalifa and urges him again to do something to what is happening in Palestine. Now the people of Baghdad, they listen to the awareness campaign by this Imam. The people started to raise voice to the Khalifa to take some action. It is said in some of the books of history that over a hundred thousand people gathered in the city of Baghdad demanding the Khalifa to take action. Now, subhanAllah, you might be thinking, well, this is the same Khalifa who previously or a few years back was requested, did not take action. Again, being requested, may not take action. But subhanAllah, the people's voice at time does have an impact. Now, when this rose from the, word, from the voice of one person to the voice of a group of people, to the voice of the people of the city, when 100,000 people raised their voice, the Khalifa was now forced to take action. So he now, obviously he still did not have any armies under him, but he sent a very strong request to the Saljuks of the time, who were having the real power in those days, in Syria and the neighboring cities. So he sent the request to the Sultan, the Saljuk Sultan, to take action. Now the Saljuk Sultan immediately gathered his army and decided to now move forward to attack and take some responsibility. The point I'm trying to make here, my dear brothers and sisters, sitting silent and idle by thinking oh, I'm just one person and cannot do anything is not necessarily going to do any good to anybody. However, we see in the past, when we talk about Salahuddin in 1187, it is not in a vacuum. The Salahuddin of 1187 was brought up, came to power, was risen from 1099 onwards. When one of the first sheikhs, he raised the voice in Baghdad in 1099 itself, then another one who raised it in 1109 or 1108, and then another one after him, they kept on raising the voice. That is when the Muslim rulers of that time took some action. Now this was one of the first battles it is called the Battle of Balat, meaning the Battle of the Field of Blood. And this battle took place in 1119, almost 20 years after losing Al-Aqsa. There were several other small battles that kept on happening on the demand of the people, of the demand of the Muslimin. And then the Saljuk Sultan took an action, gathered the army and moved forward and fought this battle. And with only 10,000 Muslim, Muslims in the army against 20,000 crusaders of that time, it was a mismatch, power-wise, experience-wise, morale-wise. However, with the advice and with the strength, 
they move forward and this was the first victory of a Muslim army against a crusader army since 1099 and when this victory came the Muslims across the globe felt that now they have the hope they have some ability to move forward to Al-Aqsa and win it back the point is again that victory will not come in a day or in a year there is an entire interim period to prepare towards that victory and one after the other Muslims kept on raising this voice the people common people the Muslim leaders the Muslim scholars they kept on raising their voice and at that time the Muslim leaders started to take some action Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about an amazing thing in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya yuhal insan ila rabbika kadhan This is in Surah al inshiqa ayah number 6 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us O human beings you must strive you must put an effort to achieve the pleasure of your Rabb and you must continue to strive put an effort until you meet him Subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us that for you to achieve the pleasure of Allah to you for you to get the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you need to continuously put an effort in his pathway now how could it be that when hundreds and thousands and hundred thousands of Muslims are being attacked and killed and massacred and we think that we do not have much to do in that scenario even today my dear brothers and sisters even today when we hear of all of this happening yes there are more than 50 Muslim countries with 50 plus armies not acting not moving an inch to protect their brothers and sisters in Gaza in Palestine however I and you have a role to play just as the Muslims from 1099 to 1187 kept on playing that role that is to raise your voice to create the awareness that is the bare minimum that I and you can do and we must continue to do that whether it is raising voice on social media whether it is raising a banner on the streets of your city whether it is gathering joining a public gathering to raise voice about the Palestinian cause whatever it is our presence is going to make a difference and let me tell you this was reported a month ago in the new in the Washington Post that the head of America the president of America and the Prime Minister of Israel they were discussing in their war room that the amount of support that is being displayed on social media is breaking their algorithms imagine the most powerful person on earth the president of America is talking to the leader of Israel who is the occupier of Palestine and telling him about your posts on social media that that is making a difference in their policies so America is now coming to a point that they're saying to Israel that you got to stop at some point because we're not able to control the world's voice the opinion of the people the public opinion is changing drastically in favor of Palestine and how is the public opinion going to change my dear brothers and sisters without your posts without your comments without your tweets nothing's going to change so if you are the one who has been active on social media if you're not start it now with your post there will be a change in the world powers imagine that you are contributing towards a position that will bring the freedom to the people of Palestine and this is one of the commands of Allah that you need to continue to struggle to put and strive hard in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah of the Quran in Surah Nisa Surah number 4 ayah number 95 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says not equal are those amongst the believers who sit idle except the ones who may be disabled or the and the ones who work hard and who fight in the cause of Allah with their wealth and with their lives so my dear brothers and sisters the position that Allah mentions in the Quran is clear that in the sight of Allah the people who don't do anything are never equal to the people who do something and those who work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are not equal to those who do not work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I and you have an opportunity today to raise our voices from wherever we are let me go back 
to the historical aspect again. So we saw the first time the question was raised, the second time the first Muslim army moved forward and fought. The second time now, so these wars that were happening, this were not happening in Palestine or the border of Palestine. These were happening outside because the Crusader army kept on taking over cities and they took almost the entire coast of Palestine of the time. In today's language, the Gaza, the city of Gaza and other cities, the neighboring Jerusalem to Gaza, they took over all of this. They took over the entire belt. And now they were looking to expand further. They were going to take over Iraq. They were going to take over Syria. And this is exactly what is the master plan even in today's time. Some of the Muslim leaders who think that they are sitting safe, this Zionist regime is not, alliance, is not an ally or a friend of anyone. At the time of their formation in 1945, we're talking about before the formation in 1948. The formation happened in 1948, but I'm talking even before that. This Zionist group were called as the terrorist number one by the British of that time. Because this Zionist group used to attack and kill even the British government workers, the policemen and their army. And there's a very popular incident by the name King David Hotel bombing. This was done by the Zionist terrorist group of that time against the British soldiers of, the, of, of Palestine of that time. So they have been continuing to attack and kill their neighbors, their allies, and definitely the entirety of Palestinians. Now, going back to the historical aspect, amongst the Muslim leaders, as I said, there was one leader in Aleppo who was having a deal with the, with the Crusaders. Now, his name was Ridwan, and there was another Muslim Sultan who fought, who was ready to fight with the Crusaders, and his name was Maudud. And on further request, he moved forward. Maudud, the, the, the king, the Sultan, he moved forward in another army, and he fought with the army of the king of Jerusalem by the name King Baldwin. This was the first time the king of Jerusalem, the, 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 the crusader king, he came out of Palestine with his army to fight a Muslim army at the outskirts of Baghdad. Now this is the first time the Muslim army defeated the direct army of crusaders that was controlling Jerusalem. King Baldwin was defeated by Maudud. Now very soon after this victory, the Muslim hopes were now at the peak. Now Maudud, he returned, and while returning, he was going through Aleppo, and this is the city of Ridwan, the Muslim ruler of that city, who was having a deal with the Crusaders. Now Maudud, after winning that battle against King Balwin, passing through Aleppo, he gets assassinated in that city. Imagine, a Muslim king was just defeated the crusaders of the time, comes to another Muslim city while passing through, and this Muslim city run by Ridwan, he gets assassinated. Now, obviously nobody can clearly claim who assassinated him, but it is said by the historians of that time that the people pointed towards Ridwan that he got him assassinated. Long story short, one of the Muslim leaders was assassinated. Very soon after that, in some time, Ridwan died, and after that, there was a power vacuum within the Muslim countries. Now that is when, the, when we saw the rising of Zangis, the dynasty that came through which came Salahuddin. Now Salahuddin was not there by himself. There was this dynasty Zangis, amongst them the first one, Imamuddin Zangi. He had this dream and vision that they're going to liberate Al-Aqsa and free the people of Palestine. He could not do it, but he kept on working towards it. Then came the time of Nuruddin Zangi, his son. He continued to raise the banner. He continued to attack the crusaders. He continued to do as much he could in order to get Al-Aqsa freed. And then came the time of Salahuddin. Now, I don't want to discuss Salahuddin today. What I want us to understand is, where is this Salahuddin going to come from? Is it that Salahuddin is going to be dropped from the heaven to rescue us today? No, the previous Salahuddin was not that. Even the modern day Salahuddin in the 21st century will not be dropped from the heaven. The Salahuddin of the 11th century was born in a house like mine and yours. He was raised up by a family like mine and yours. He would attend the masjid like my and your kids of today. A Salahuddin was raised in a house like mine and yours. So my dear brothers and sisters, the message that I want to leave you with today is raise. We have a responsibility to raise a Salahuddin in our house. Let us raise a Salahuddin in every house. 
It is only then that we will see a day tomorrow that there will come a Salahuddin who will liberate Al-Aqsa, who will free Palestine once again as the promise of Allah and his messenger is there. But the job and the responsibility is mine and yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran and he reminded us in Surah Rab, ayah number 11, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verily, he does not change the situation of a people, the condition of a people, unless they change that which is within themselves. We need to come back to the practice of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to make sure that our five pillars of Islam are completed. We need to make sure that our salah is completed. We need to make sure that our ibadah is complete. Our fasting, our, you know, our umrah and hajj, our responsibility is giving zakat and sadaqah. All of this is fulfilled. And our relationships with our brothers and sisters, whether it's with your family members, whether your wife, your children, your husband, your parents, your children, whatever it is, make sure that your relationships, your responsibilities, according to the commands of Allah and His Messenger are fulfilled. Do not be an oppressor in the people around you. How could you imagine that Allah will remove the oppression from this ummah when I and you as individuals are continuing to do oppression within ourselves? or within our circles, or within our communities. Make sure that we become a role model for the practice of Islam. And then continue to raise your voice for the plight of the Palestinian people. Try and understand whether you can talk about it in your workplace, or whether you talk about it with, with your neighbors, or whether you can talk to people on social media, or whether you can go and join a public gathering in the city. Whatever it is, raise the banner of Palestine in the best capacity that is in yours. We have absolute freedom in this country, alhamdulillah. We have a right, we have a responsibility to raise this concern. I would come to the conclusion by reminding that our purpose of life, my dear brothers and sisters, is to live according to the commands and the obedience of Allah and His Messenger. And one of that commands, one of that aspects of obedience is to make sure that we have this feeling, our hearts should be attached to Al-Aqsa, to the people of Palestine. It is one of the three holiest sites. How could it be that one of the three, only three holiest sites where you can visit for the purpose of journey according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the only three most where when you go and pray, it's multiplied hundreds and thousands of times. Out of it, it's amazing blessings. Now, if it has been snatched from us, and it's not just that Al-Aqsa is snatched from us, but the people around Al-Aqsa are being massacred day in, day out. How could we keep quiet? It's our voice, when you raise the voice, Australian government for the first time in its history has voted against the state of Israel in the United Nations Security Council. It is the first time in 75 years of occupation that you see a country like South Africa raises a legal case against the state of Israel in the International Court of Justice. It is for the first time in 75 years you see Indonesia raising a case against the state of Israel in the International case, uh, Court of Justice. All of this did not happen in a vacuum. All of this happened because there was a voice that was raised. Join that voice, my dear brothers and sisters. I conclude from the ayah of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands in Surah Al-Am, Surah number 6, ayah number 162. Say, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verily my salah, my prayers, my sacrifice, my living and my dying are all for the sake of my Rabbul Alameen, the Rabb that controls everything.